episode 37. We have a fantastic lineup with us today. We've just found out we have a lot of similarities as well in various things, and you'll be discovering some of those in the coming hour. This episode will talk both about all the challenges that Puerto Rico has faced, some would say catastrophes, in the area of earthquakes and aftershocks and floods and COVID and you know, lack of electricity and access to the internet and schools having to be repaired, curriculum being kind of top down instead of bottom up and all the changes that they had to face in the midst of, of multiple pandemics. And in, in the midst of that, some corruption along the way, <laughs> just add that in there, you know? And so uh, we'll hear a bit about that, but we'll, we'll turn over to a, a couple of teachers who are also graduate students right now, but a couple of teachers who will describe what they've been able to do to overcome all the challenges and all the obstacles that have been faced in Puerto Rico during the past couple of years, whether it's Hurricane Maria or COVID or something else. So my good friend, Edgar Leon, Dr. Edgar Leon, has his doctorate from the university or from Michigan State University, where two of our co-hosts are we're, were teachers at, at one point in time. And so there's some similarities there as well. So Edgar has found his way back to the island and has been involved in a couple different universities down there, Caribbean University being one, and has been able to try to make a difference in the world of education in various ways. So he'll be describing some of that. Uh, Edgar, would you like to maybe give a brief overview of your transition down to Puerto Rico and what's inspired you during the past few years in the midst of all the crises, in the midst of all the calamities, and then maybe show us a few slides so the audience can appreciate what you've been able to overcome that perhaps no other island, no other country has faced during this past few years, you have definitely faced some unique challenges. Sure, sure. Well, well thanks a lot for having us, and uh, welcome to everybody who's listening to the to the program. Uh, we have had some uh, very very interesting changes, very interesting events that are, uh, I could say, unique to the island. But I think uh, we have had s s teachers that are so terrific and so creative and uh, that did not rely on anything other than community uh, within themselves. Uh, I'm amazed. Uh, what brought me here? I've always, even though I was working in Michigan, I, every year I had to come to the island. I came to the island and uh, went right into the water, into the beach, and then went into the mountains. So it's like, uh, that. those are those were my vitamins for the rest of the year. So I usually came every year. and. Uh, and the, the last, uh, in 19, let me see, uh, 2012, I received a, uh, you know, a piece of paper saying, well, there's, there's this position in Puerto Rico. So I applied just, you know, just so it was for the University of Puerto Rico to be at the, uh, uh, to work, especially with technology, to, to, to promote technology and to start with this type of thing of teaching online and all that. And believe it or not, they hired me in the spot. I just came for an interview. And they said, when, when did we start? I said, what? This is crazy. I mean, I can't do this. I have to, you know, <laughs> it's like, but again, uh, having it in, 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 in theory is one thing and having it in practice is another because you can have a, one person on boat, but the rest of the people, it was a scary thought to have, to have the University of Puerto Rico with courses online. I mean, that means letting go of all the control and and uh, you know and letting go and, and changing all the laws and changing all the committees that had to approve this and so it was more like a, I, I was like the strange fellow in a different town here comes this guy with all these new ideas and and, and i'm going to lose control of everything he's going to start teaching online and then i said well why are you teaching just from eight to five i mean uh, at msu we started teaching more at five from five to ten or five to eleven o'clock at night 
uh, even Saturdays or Sundays. But people could not understand this. So I was, I was, you know, kind of struggling in that area. But I kept on training teachers like, like, like Carmen and, and Alyssa. But teachers did understand. The new teachers did understand about this. And they also wondered, why am I not getting courses on how to teach online or how to use and apply technology? Because even the Department of Education saw technology as an add-on. Like, okay, here's the old curricula that you had. And then just put a put a movie on, and that will be the integration of technology, or just uh, going to this website. That's your integration of technology. So they, they didn't see it the way we saw it, where, where you have the kids produce and do projects and and develop uh, technology for themselves to learn by teach them how to learn by themselves. So that's you know uh, there are many factors, you know, but again I I can teach I can show you some of the slides. So I want to talk about also yeah, I think the. So, uh, I think you should show us slides, a quick overview of, of them, so okay. the whole audience can understand, and we can have this recorded, and then we can hear okay. from the teachers and how they okay. overcame some things. This so, is the island, so you can have a perspective of the island here, and this is this is where our, our hurricane uh, came through, uh, 140 miles an hour. Hurricane went right through the island. So that that's one of the events that we had that shows you the, you know the. the so it came through uh, Guayama, which is the south part, came through the north part, northwest part. But it basically, it was so wide that it took it took the whole island and, and it made a disaster out of it. So, so this is Ed what happened. Yeah, Edgar, it's Hurricane Maria is the one you're Hurricane about. Maria. Many come nearby, but that's the one that struck you. Hurricane Maria. Irma came through, but Irma just barely hit the island in the northern part. Yeah, so but some this of our one audience went, will watch this later. We'll look this up then. But this one went right through the middle, from one side to the other, and you had uh, you had rain for two days, as soon as the power went out. Because see the power, uh, that's what 150 mile an hour winds do. To me. And they, it also had some um, some uh, tornadoes, small tornadoes that will just take out whatever. And not all the homes are cement homes; some of them have sorts of things there this is another example and gives you look at the sky that's what you would see when when this thing came uh water will take everything and just just move it like a big bulldozer uh so that's it. that's the some of the this is what it did to the schools it went into the schools went right in and pushed everything out and so that's that gives you and they and then I'm giving you an example of what teachers quickly did uh, the next day or two days after, hey, we got to teach. We, let's let's get the kids together. Let's get the parents together and let's do put things in tarps. Um, the National Guard moved quickly. Uh, thanks to them, we had some of the facilities and, and uh, some coordination through that, through the emergency system. This is another example of what the water did. No kid could go in there. Two reasons. One, it was a dangerous thing. You may have electrical poles going, touching this water. You may have also some sorts of uh, dead people floating around, believe it or not. So you didn't want that either. So you would have to be at home, totally. So these are shocks that you're getting to that. And these are, this is an example of, of schools could not be open for everybody because some of them were used as uh, uh, places for the people to stay. Oh, that's basically it. You were at a school. You don't know. You lost your home. You go right to a school to sleep and get some some assistance. You know. And here's uh, the police giving water to people. Everybody pitched in. Everybody pitched in. Uh, we had another situation is that because of this emergency, we found out that we only get food uh, through San Juan, which is one side of the island. We don't get food or from any place else other than the United States, we are not allowed to have food or anything else from any other country. So that also puts some strain on it. This is another example. We're talking here, the earthquake. After Maria, then came the earthquake, <laughs> 5.9, uh, richer scale earthquake. Uh, it, this gives you an idea of where it hit the most. But even though it hit down here in the southwest part, it, it shook the whole island. And uh, since we have old buildings and we have 
uh, the infrastructure is kind of old. Yeah, it affected everything. Uh, believe it or not, uh, all the power systems are in the southern part of the island. They're in the south. So as soon as this hits, all the power was cut off from everybody. So that's basically uh, another impacting thing. And here's what it did to the schools. It basically just squashed uh, some of the classrooms. Uh, the design and the uh, how old they were uh, contributed to these these things, but uh, and they're still not open. This is another example of what happened to the schools, and this is just one example. Many schools right now, half of our schools, close to 500 of them, are closed. Uh, so that's that put a lot of strain into the system, also what to do with the kids, where are they going to teach. In some of these places, I don't have schools yet. They're still waiting for the money. We you know, have had 8% of the money from FEMA. That, that's about eight, 8 billion. We were allocated about 70 some billion dollars for it, but it's still not there. Nothing is moving yet. And we still have these heroes teaching. Here you go, where they uh, have the kid, the teacher still doing, in some of the places we still have this. Believe it or not, we still have this going on. So, my, my, and uh, the kids, well, they have no other place to do, uh, to go. Uh, parents don't have work. Some of them don't have work. Some of them stay at home with them, but it puts a lot of uh, stress on, on their psyche. That's basically it. I, I think we could take it to the teachers to, to see what the, what they may say about Before this. Before we go to the teachers, you also had an issue of internet access and, and the use of mobile devices there. Because uh, I know my teachers, my students worked on a project for your teachers in Puerto Rico to teach them how to use mobile. But that is, your, that is correct. That your is government correct. banned mobile before that. Could you just talk a little bit about the, the issues that you that, that, that they faced across the country because of the technology policies? Maybe yes. we can get that later, but briefly now. Well, since since we have since we have this, we don't we it took us by surprise, and everything is dislocated. So uh, they had no idea what they were dealing with, and uh, it's not organized. The way people were receiving internet access, schools had ex didn't have access at all. School only had about twenty five megs, and I wrote that in the book. The book I wrote was because I found all these inconsistencies while I was at the university. So I sat down and wrote a book about. The conditions of schools with it with technology and, the, and i said they have nothing because if you have just 25 megs for a school of 700 people that's not going to do anything so you, you can't get even though they say yeah well, you're connected and teachers could vouch for that um and still don't have it uh, but again uh, as soon as you lose power you lose internet because the internet that we have in puerto rico is not with batteries uh, so you lose power one side it's gone and uh, companies, we only have two companies, and they mostly treat highly populated places where they can get better business. So basically, San Juan, Carolina, Bayamon, you know, that's where they set up the rest of the island, which is the digital divide that we have now, is because of rural and and city uh, is bad news. They they still don't have it. They still don't have it. They rely on 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 cellular phones, which is very limited and uh, in other means that they may have. But right now, we still don't have enough internet. Um, the, the, the Department of Education uh, went to give them a little pamphlets. Uh, they sent it to Columbia to get printed. They're still waiting for them. <laughs> I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's been a little uh, funny, but I mean, it's, uh, meanwhile, the teachers are doing their job. The teachers are, are looking at the standards and say they have to learn this, and they're doing it. So so maybe we need to hear from Carmen and Betsy. Um, sure. And, and then Chris and Young will jump in with some questions. But uh, maybe you might want to, uh, would you like to comment on what Edgar has said so far and, and what, you're, what you've been doing in the midst of all these um, dilemmas that you're facing? Carmen, you want to start? OK. Um, well, um, since Maria, I guess. Yeah. Since, our, since Maria, okay. Well, um, in my school, we are we are in Ponce. Um, Doctor Leon, if you show them where is Ponce, it's, yeah, it's in the uh, southern part of the island. The south southern part of the, part of the island. That's basically in the, where. It's... In the map of the hurricane, the the name Ponce is in the south, 
uh, right in the center of the south line of the island. And there the hurricane struck um, in many ways, but emotionally, it was very, very, very important for my students and for me because some of them um, struggled with the um, lack of internet and my students are addicted to internet and to the social media. So that was, that was very difficult to them to adapt to um, um, a way of living without internet. So uh, when they went to school, uh, they, they verbalized the, um, that um, social uh, lack of contact because they have to go out to the street and communicate with their neighbors because they, they were always inside of their home when they had internet before Maria. And that emotionally affected them. I, I, I'm very um, aware of that. So um, before Maria, they, the things were um, working like normal. We were doing our classes uh, very traditionally, but since that uh, hurricane struck our island, um, the outage of those resources and those um, tools to communicate were very, um, I told you, um, abrupt, um, um, a change, a very strong change. So they um, have to adapt since then. They have so to adapt Carmen, since then. You teach in the STEM areas, in yes. physics, and you teach robotics. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to teach robotics since, you know, and, and now during COVID times? I mean, how are you? No, um, I have to make a standby um, in that in that aspect because for robotics we have a, a my classroom have a table a big table and so many uh, tools um, that's a mess in the classroom because we have always um, a student working there um, uh, building something um, and programming also and they have to be uh, there they have to be together and the COVID had affected that's that aspect because we have to be in our home and some parents have lost, you know, lost their jobs and sometimes some of them have uh, working hours reduced so the um, uh, economically in con in the economic impact in that way uh, have affected the um, robotics in my area so I have I had um, to put it in standby for this time for this year, mm -hmm. and I'm um, concentrating in my physics class and meteorology class and um, astronomy class. So um, I'm looking for on online resources to help them to to deal with the the social distancing. I think we'll want to get to that in this. I want to get to Betsy Beth first, but I want I do want, we want to probe how you're providing resources that are online and and what what that's been been able to overcome. But Betsy Beth, could you tell us a bit about what what you do, what you teach, and what you faced, and how you've you know overcome part of it? Uh, go ahead. Well, uh, I am a Spanish teacher, Spanish secondary teacher. For Maria, I was working in Hayuya, in my town, and it was a very hard experience. We never worked so hard. Um, I was not raised, you know, uh, cleaning in the mud and all that. And for Maria, all the teachers were working to put the school back together. We were the ones that worked cleaning the rooms, uh, getting the school ready for the students to come back. So it was a very hard, a very, very hard time. It just came to demonstrate that we were not ready. We were not actually ready. Then after that came the, happens the, the tremors and the 6.4 uh, earthquake. And I was working in Ponce. Um, that's uh, an hour from Hayuya. 
And that was very hard too. I have students that lost their homes and I haven't seen my students um, since last year. Since December last year, I haven't seen my students because of all that situation. The school is not ready to receive us back. The structure is not ready. And I believe no school in Ponce is ready to, to receive back the students. So we have been struggling online. Our first experience teaching online. We have been using Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, and many different applications since for uh, from January to May, we were using WhatsApp, Facebook, the cell phones, um, Edmodo, Moodle. So everyone was grabbing whatever they could manage to reach the students and, you know, just deal with the skills that they needed to, they needed to approve or learn to be ready, ready for the next year. They, they are actually not ready because it's not the same and we were not prepared. We were not prepared emotionally. We were not prepared um, professionally. I have, I have some knowledge because I did my certificate of educating online, but that was me and many, um, maybe some other teachers, but it's not, you know, not everyone has the same preparation. So we were working together, we were communicating, what do you know, what can we use as, as teams to get to the kids, to teach them whatever they needed, and, and also to bring them some kind of uh, social connection, some, some kind of normal. And then we were hit, we were hit by COVID-19, and it's just being a disaster. I was just wondering, uh, all of you feel free to answer this question. Because now with the COVID, one of the big questions people are talking about um, is the loss of learning. You know, they said loss of learning because children are not able to go to school. But you've been going through Maria, you've been going through earthquakes. So you've had a lot of disruptions. I want to actually look at um, both sides. One side is that there may be some loss of learning from the classroom because you're not having them. But at the same time, I think this tough times can also help children learn something, help teachers learn something. Can you comment on, on that, all of you, uh, Edgar, uh, Carmen, and uh, uh, Bezabeth? Bezabeth, we're gonna start with you since you're here. Yes, uh, well, it have teach us to deal with things in a different way. So we have been pushed to look for different solutions because we cannot wait for everything to be solved from us. Actually, uh, uh, in that year, in Maria, 2017, my students wrote a book. This is it. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. yeah stories. They wrote a book about stories for kids. So that was our project. And we were having a hard time. And I just grabbed and uh, looked for a better solution for them to work together and feel proud of themselves to, the, you know, to take them away from all that was going on. Because you cannot take away all that is normal, even though things are hard, it's like right now. You have to look for solutions and you have to deal with yourself. You have to deal with your emotions and look for some things that may be attractive to them so they, they feel that, you know, this, we can deal with this. It's not gonna last forever. In the meantime, so we look, what can we do with what we have? So that was part of it. That's what we have been doing. Thank you, Beth. I, I like that. That's what we all have to do. Uh, Carmen, what, what, what do you think? What's the good, the powerful things that we learn from this? Oh. Uh, from these disasters, we uh, I have learned I have learned that this is a great opportunity to overcome. 
to overcome, to raise from, from the ashes, to raise from the bottom. Uh, uh, this is the goal. My goal is to make the students to develop critical thinking through science because I am a physics teacher. And um, I want them to learn how to solve difficult problems because some of my students want to be um, engineers, some want to be doctors. They have dreams, they have aspirations. So I, I help them to improve themselves, to re-emerge from the, from the disaster. So um, this is the, the opportunity for me as a teacher, as a human being, as a person to, to, uh, to give, to contribute to their uh, development and to build, to help them some, uh, to help them to build their lives, um, to um, practically to um, learn from the environment, learn from nature, learn, learn from this experience to make them strong, very strong. And um, in, through my class, I give them news, I give them realities about uh, what is happening around them. We, we learn, they learn about the, um, the news of the corruption, the uh, whatever it, is, it takes, or the earthquakes, and everything is happening in the island. So they are aware, maybe they are aware of uh, their reality to, um, to think and to be, uh, to think or, or make ideas about how to improve or to make better things to make um, better society for the future. Thank you for that. Chris, do you have a question? You are going to... Uh, what yes, about I do. Did you want to comment on that one too? Edgar? You're muted, Edgar. Edgar, you... Just a minute, okay. Just a couple of stories. Um, Sorry, Chris. We, we are experiencing the higher education part. Um, that also has changed immensely. Uh, most of the professors who were not versed with this, I've seen them go away. I mean, they just left uh, because they could not cope with teaching online. Uh, some of them, some of them stayed. Some of them have been trained. I was part of the training team, and most of the most of my emphasis was on the methodology has changed. You cannot teach this as a classroom uh, method with the math classroom methodology. It doesn't happen that way. You have to uh, think that the student has to learn what you want them to learn, and you have to motivate the student. You will not be able to motivate the student if you do the classroom as you had before. It's not going to happen. So that's basically one of the things. The other part, the other part was, uh, I have seen also that the Department of Education is is in total collapse. Has collapsed totally the administration. I mean, the, the principals that have no idea of how to how to deal with their teachers and how to show them how to learn online or teach online. So all these all these uh, bureaucracies and, and administrative um, mechanisms uh, basically are not justifiable during this time. We're just spending money like crazy trying to justify all these positions and they they have no impact whatsoever even if they try, because right now the learning is happening at home between the teachers and the parents and the kids. Uh, the last part is that the parents realize that the school is not, a, is not a daycare center anymore. School is for learning. So they're a part of that learning. Uh, otherwise, the kid won't learn. And uh, right now, well, they have this catch-22 good things. Well, it's good and bad. That's one of those parents probably lost their jobs. I'm sure that one of them had, had done it. So what they do is they pick up on learning and most of the parents are worried about the kids learning. So they don't end up having the same experiences that the parents have right now with lack of work due to lack of education. So even though it's a, it's a pandemic, it's all these experience, it helps promote education in a certain way that uh, it's never done before. I know the teachers are aware of that. Oh, Chris, sorry, I cut you off earlier. No worries. Right. Sorry. So one of the things that, that we really like about Silver Lining for Learning that keeps us going 
is seeing the patterns that emerge across different countries, commonalities that all of us have, no matter where we live. And one of those commonalities, because of the pandemic and other kinds of catastrophes, has been unexpected heroes. Uh, in every country that I've seen, including the United States, there have been many educators who have been paralyzed by things not being business as usual. They, they freeze and they say, I don't know what to do and I don't know how to do it. And so I'm not gonna do anything until somebody tells me what to do and somebody tells me how to do it. And that's, that's true for teachers, it's true for university faculty members, it's true for national leaders and state leaders. But there's a second group in every country that basically says, our responsibility is to the kids. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it, but I'm gonna start doing something anyway because our responsibility is to the students and the families. And, and those are the unexpected heroes. The people that nobody thought were leaders have become leaders. And the leaders often that people thought were actually leaders have turned out to be hollow. So as that happened <coughs> in Puerto Rico, which arguably, as we've said, has faced more misfortune than any other country that we've had on this show. How did, how did the individuals that said to themselves, I'm gonna make a difference, I'm not gonna wait around for somebody to tell me what to do and how to do it. How did they organize? Did they, did they just talk to each other? Did the universities play a role? Was, was there any role that, that happened top down or was it all bottom up? I'd love to hear the story of how the heroes emerged and started to do things. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, can, I can speak for the university. I, my phone got off the hook real quick. I mean, uh, I'm the guy in technology. So basically they started calling me. I mean, the dean called me around 11 o'clock at night. Uh, we need help. I mean, we have to do this. We, we have to continue teaching. Uh, let's get together for some ideas. Let's start putting together something. We have a wonderful crew. Uh, of teachers right now, of university professors that are pro uh, teaching online. And it's not just uh, how to use Teams, because most of the time, uh, some of the states, including Puerto Rico, the only thing they do in their training is how to turn on Teams, how to use it, and how to turn it off. It has nothing to do with how people learn or how to teach with Teams or how to integrate that into the learning environment. Uh, for that, you need a university course and an educator to do it who has done it before. Can't be done through theory because there are many, there, one class doesn't fit all. I mean, in this case, especially. So uh, it, it, the, the teachers can tell you something very interesting also. Class management, they're having, they're having a hard time with class management teaching online. And I don't know if we've touched that before, but they've experienced that. I'll let, I'll let them explain that one to you. <laughs> Me or Beth? Okay, um, my experience is that, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my experience is that um, this is a 24 seven job. I was telling Beth before this uh, meeting that um, I had for my student on, on August when the classes began, I just um, told them their uh, chat on the WhatsApp, the, the rules from to use the WhatsApp chat. So I told them it's from Monday to Friday until 6.30 p.m. Okay, that's no problem. But my students take uh, daily eight classes online. So they stay uh, see, um, on their seats, um, yes, eight classes, because it's a specialized uh, in science and math school, high, uh, high school. So they take eight classes. Um, they do uh, scientific research. They do math research. So they uh, have a lot of struggle and 
um, a burden of work, a lot of work to do academically. Uh, so they have no time to do the assignments or a later time because they have to help them par the, their parents to do the, the home, the house chores. So um, they began to write my, to my message, uh, message to my, to my phone, you know, to WhatsApp until 9 p.m., 10 p.m. So I had to continue being teacher, being teacher as I'm a, a wife, I'm a, I'm a mother, I'm a student. So yeah, I, ha I am um, 24 seven teacher because I don't, I don't like to leave my students behind. I don't like to leave my students with a doubt or a concern until the next day. I have to, to attend that um, doubt or wh whatever they, they need to learn or whatever they need to, to get. So that information I give them when they need it. That's my vocation. Betsy Bell, you wanna address the question that Chris had and the other comments made after that? Yes. Um, where to start? Okay. We have <laughs> lack of, we cannot rely on communication services. That's the first thing. We cannot rely on the internet service. We cannot rely on the smartphones. We cannot assume that they all have a smartphone at home. Even though the Department of Education gave the students a laptop, I sincerely, I don't know if they all have their laptops by now. They don't. I, I doubt it, but- They don't. They have, there have been this movement, you know, to give every student a laptop and there has been the alternate remedial models that they printed out in Colombia. They just arrived in some places in Ponce. We have them now. We are going. We are going to to get to that now. But the instructions, you know, they change every every time. So we have to deal with that too. And what can I say? We have to teach. There is a curriculum that we have to work with. We cannot work with that curriculum in the same way as if we were in the classroom because it's not the same situation. I cannot have a student in front of the computer for my class for one hour and 10 minutes because I see some groups Mondays and Wednesdays and some others Tuesdays and Thursdays. I teach seventh grade. It's inhumane to have a student one hour for my class in front of the computer, one hour for the other, one for the other one, without knowing if, if they have a, they can rely on the internet. I have students that live in public residentials. They cannot have some services because they don't allow cables and all that. So they have to pay for satellite and that is expensive. And it's not the same service. So there are many factors that affect. And what, what do we do? We look at the curriculum as a specialist and we, we see what, it, what are the skills that they, they need to learn. And we try to summarize that and to work with integrating the skills in different activities so we can teach what they need to know in certain, a certain way. But we know that by, by the end of the year, it's going to be a gap. There's gonna be a learning gap that is gonna be affecting them from now on every year. And it has been going on since Maria, they have a gap. So it is getting, it's getting, uh, what wider. is the word? Wider. wider. It's getting wider every time. And that is gonna repercute then when they go to, when they go to the university, what can we do? We know that we have to teach, we look for different ways. Uh, we communicate with the parents. You know, we are doing this, we are in this unit right now. We are gonna be working with these um, activities this week. In case you have any problem, please communicate via the email. You know, communication is very important because we need to know what is going on at home. If they cannot connect the day, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Young, before uh, you I get to that, Young, I that want just... Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that is, um, Punia raised the question because when we heard from other places uh, after COVID, of course, your um, tragedy has gone through longer. Uh, we're just wondering, have you noticed parents and or students become more actively working with you to solve the problems together? You know, do you see a rise of parents to say more actively engaging their students? They are more in contact with you. They are more chatting with you, trying to find solutions to contribute to that. Yeah, I would like to ask Beth, Beth Carmen and Edgar to, to just address that a little bit. We have a little bit of everything. We have parents that communicate very often, that work very hard with us. You know, as, as we work as a team. Uh, they are constantly looking at what we are working with the teachers and giving support. And sadly, we have some that just disappear. They are not there. I don't know, maybe, I cannot say there is no interest. I don't know if, you know, what is going on at home? What is the situation with the work, with providing food, you know, worries, mental health is another very big issue that affects them. So we yeah. have a little bit of everything. Yeah, even though even though um, it's different, but again, uh, this situation has opened up the door so the teacher could see inside the house. And uh, some of them have detected all sorts of things, uh, overcrowded people. Uh, mom and dad uh, listening to reggaeton and while he's studying, uh, yes. uh, you know, noises in excess. Uh, grandma, grandpa are running around the place. Uh, kids are running and playing. So it's uh, that's what I was talking about control. So the environment has changed. Yes, the positive is that the, te the, the parent knows the name of the teacher now. It, maybe it happened before they didn't even know the names of teachers. They just, you know, they were just watching TV or whatever. But now they have to be involved, especially if you have more than one child. So you have more than one child and, and you have only one computer or two or three computers, but still the internet goes, goes away that way. So just relying, the teachers don't, don't get any directives from, from the Department of Ed that are clear. They just say, here are the tools and you, you know, do whatever you can and, and we're going to give you these books. And, and pray that uh, when they give them the state test, which is idiotic, I'm just going to say it out loud. There's no way they're going to pass the state test. So why give it? I mean, uh, or pay for it. Uh, my, my recommendations for them, even in an article that I wrote, uh, is that cut that off and just duplicate the amount of teachers that you have and don't mm -hmm. spend any money on any administration whatsoever. I mean, and any of these things that cannot justify the help of the kids because they're two, three years behind, like our teachers are, covered, are saying right now. Uh, I don't say fire them. I say, well, find out like we did in Michigan uh, is that ask the question, who can teach? And who has teaching degrees here? So let's go to schools. Let's find these kids and start teaching and just switch them. You get paid the same, but the medicine is given to the sickness. You just you just can't just let them let them and find out. Okay, well, give me a computer and like, give them a pamphlet and find out if by chance something's gonna happen. Herman, you want to add to uh, Punya's que uh, answer to Punya's question, which was uh, family involvement. The family the family involvement. I w I believe it's increased. It's increased because they're forced to increase it because they can't. One, the governor doesn't allow you to get out of your house. First of all, you know we're in lockdown. That's for starters. Secondly, is that they want us, those who have kids that are certain, certain, um, certain age, certain grades, like, uh, like elementary, they're more involved. So they don't want the kids to flood. So they help them out and they, they, they're there assisting all the time. But the uh, ones from fifth grade up, I, that's where I think things are kind of shaky right now. Car Carmen, do you want to add briefly to that? We got, a, we got 15 yes, minutes uh, left and we have uh, uh, several more questions, but yeah, go ahead. Yes, I want to add that in my in my way, I help my students to self-regulate learning, so they are responsible about what they have to do to learn, to get out from where they are to be better. So I 
I help them to transform and to become owners owners of their own learning, so they they can be more responsible to to uh, get that learning to be more prepared for the university because my students are from are, are from 12th grade they are seniors and they have um um yes their their parents are very involved but they are leaders they they self regulate themselves in this case in my in my case Thank you. I just want to add, Thank Carmen, I, I'm very happy to hear that you see students, because of this, have to become more self-regulated. They just have to do more on their own. That, that's yes. great. Thank oh, you yes. so much. Yes. I, 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 I record to them um, tutorials because um, some of um, the um, physics problems are very long or difficult, and I record for them uh, tutorials and record many, thing, many things for, for them so they can get to the um, class later. And they, um, they, they get to them by themselves. I, I am not like a police. <laughs> go go to, the, to, the, to the recording and get them and do their, your homework. No, they come to me. The yeah, audiobooks have surfaced, resurfaced, and are expanding. The audiobooks are, are working. I can yes. talk about experience. My kid, she's 15, and she had to read a novel, and she just she just went to the audiobook, and she she you know she took it and absorbed yes. it and, and aced the, the class because uh, yes. she went from paper to to uh, technology, basically with her earphones on, and she she actually heard it about two times. She said that she's never going to sit down and read it two times. So the, with this, she was moving and walking around and doing exercise while she was listening to her. You just have to give them those options. Sometimes we forget them. Well, I, I think we're going to talk about, I want to get to this at the end on what this poses to the future. But first, I want to say that Chris's earlier question about heroes, part group number two, we have three of those heroes with us right here. Edgar, Thank Carmen. You. And that's the best. Thank so, you. Um, you know, all of you should be applauded for what you've been able to do. I'm sure there's hundreds more back in Puerto Rico uh, that we could be uh, talking to right now. But thank you for, for coming into the show today, um, the three of you, because you definitely are heroes in, in, uh, in across this, the entire globe. What, what you've been able to do um, is phenomenal. So, uh, and Chris has a follow up question. Yeah, well, building on what you're saying, Kurt, we have many educators who who watch these episodes, um, sometimes live, maybe more often as archives. And some of them are going to be saying to themselves right at this point in the program, this sounds a lot like my country. I mean, we didn't have a hurricane and we didn't have an earthquake, <laughs> but the pandemic is rising families are trapped at home, there's not enough technology, the country's leadership is paralyzed. And, and they're looking to you as a lighthouse of hope. What advice do you have for teachers in other countries that teachers and professors and, and other educators that might be helpful to them as, as they struggle with, with what you struggle with? I would say take charge. I would say take charge immediately. We did that uh, when we had uh, when we had Maria, the Hurricane Maria. When it came in, I had no pa no power. What I did was I took out the battery of my car, hooked it up to my radio, and started calling people like crazy. And I finally connected with somebody in San Juan, uh, who was uh, one of the directors of the power company, who was also a radio person. And uh, I said, "Hey, my voice is totally in the dark. So please relay the message that we're gonna need help down here." And then I immediately start calling people at the United States. And I talked to everybody around I could. I was probably two hours talking. And then I'll be in the communication center for Maya West here at home because everyone was lining up to talk to their families because they couldn't. There was no phone. So you have to take charge. Don't wait for anybody. Don't wait for anybody. Uh, don't wait for any committee to meet. Don't wait for anybody to uh, put you through all this regulation, that regulation. Just start acting because the kids, the time is passing. And this is precious moments that kids need to learn now. 
they just can't wait for anything. So that's what. Well, what are your strengths? And you're a ham radio operator. <laughs> you're unique, and you're the only one whose ham radio worked on your part of the island, if I'm not mistaken. Isn't that yes, right? Yes, that's correct. So you were the only you were the only tool that was available. So you know, and that might be the case in other countries where you might be the, the, the your skill might be the exact skill that's needed. Take charge. Well, we had um, we had we had AM radio stations. All of them went, went down except the one from Maya West because he was the only one who had a power connected, the real power. Because people were making tests, and they were making tests with electricity. They were not making tests with a power, with you know with external power. So basically, and, and this was the only one on. I think it was Wapa, Wapa Radio, and and uh, Wally or something like that. It was just two stations. But that was it. I mean, we had nothing else. And uh, they could testify to that, that there was no no, no communication whatsoever. Carmen or Beth, Beth, you want to address Chris's question? Beth, you first. Well, my, my advice is to work with other teachers. We cannot make it harder to the students, so we have to work together. Right now, I am working in a project with my, with the English teacher so they don't know what they are doing but the same i did here we are going to do we are going to work in a bilingual book and we are going to you know get them to write and and get out whatever they are feeling right now so we are going to manage that emotional part working with the skills in english and spanish but we are going to produce something to make them proud and, you know, uh, make them believe that they can do anything and they, they have to work with whatever they have. So that is my best advice. Work in teams with other teachers. What can they do together to make it less work and still work in the skills that they need to, to develop? And our audience should know that Betsabeth is a award-winning poet as well as a Spanish teacher. So um, her skills are varied and, and quite mo uh, like Edgar's, he has many skills too. Carmen, would you like my to My advice, yes, my advice is to never give up, never give up, to be strong for the students, to um, uh, through the experience and the test and the challenge we are facing, to be strong. Um, maybe we'll shed some tears <laughs> sometimes because it's a lot of work and it's frustrating sometimes. But um, we want to improve ourselves um, through this experience. We want to be um, more wise, to be more um, uh, with, a, with, 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 our, with our knowledge. We want to give the tools to our students to manage situations, to overcome uh, everything that will come in the future. So this experience may be, um, is uh, an, um, a, a tool for learning. This is, this is a tool for learning. We, we, we can see this COVID and these earthquakes and hurricanes as something negative, but through my eyes, through, through my experience, I can tell you that it's all learning, 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 become more wise, more uh, competent for me. Um, this, is, this makes uh, our nation, our island more stronger because the experience is the key. We learn through experience. And this challenge is another way to learn, to overcome. This is life. That's exactly where I wanted to get to. You're talking about the experiences that you've learned from. Do you think both personally and as a territory across the island, do you think people have learned new skills and competencies that will carry and be carry forward and be sustainable? That there's educational changes that have occurred during the past year, during the past yes. three years, that my example. are are going yes. to influence yes. them. I know Betsy Beth talked about using Edmodo and WhatsApp, and you also, Carmen, WhatsApp and Edgar with Teams. Those are technologies, but Edgar also alluded to the pedagogies mm -hmm. that and the integration, thoughtful integration of technology 
uh, and the marriage with it within the culture that and, and the curriculum that, that you're uh, faced with. So I, I wonder if you might want to talk a bit about the future and, and your maybe optimism or pessimism based on what you've experienced during the past few years there um, when things are resolved, when all these things are at least halfway overcome or, you know, get, get towards that um, end of the tunnel. What do you think it will be like teaching in Puerto Rico, being a student in Puerto Rico, um, <laughs> being an administrator in Puerto Rico? Any comments there? No, we're, we're, I'm optimistic about it, uh, especially recently we just had elections and there was a sweep through. Uh, again, uh, that tells you that the kids are studying. The other thing is that I tell my students to publish and my graduate students, I published an article. I said, I thought nobody was going to read it. And, it's, it, and it was about the, the Maria storm. And it had over 220,000 people read it. And I know it wasn't from Puerto Rico. So it, and it was, a, it was a, a little article on New uh, York, published out of New Jersey, out of a, a magazine in New Jersey. And it was called uh, La Mentira Se Levanta. So it's like the, the, lie is, the lie is there. And I just spelled out everything that was going on and everything that needed to happen. So I gave challenges and solutions. And I'm looking at the numbers and it's said 220,000 people. Wow, I, I've never thought in my life that I would have something like that. So you should publish. I have some of my students now that have uh, articles that people, 40,000, 50,000 people reading it. So it's a different time. It used to be local regional. Now the world is reading what you publish, especially if it makes uh, gives them a meaning of something. That is amazing. I know you're also translating or taking part of my Tech Variety book and turning it into Spanish. Um, and I'm assuming it's some of that's been used. Um, well, yeah, we did we did translations of the uh, of the Larry Lazard uh, uh, schools of the material. So it's uh, in the state of Michigan. Also, we did the, the state test in Spanish. We were an advocate for people who were flunking the test, not because we, they didn't know the test, it's because they didn't know the language of the test. So we had a plenty of migrants. As soon as I translated the home, uh, the migrants are doing a lot better than the locals. So they, <laughs> when they were doing it, so basically that's that's my experience. Right? Let if you're a graduate student, if you're if you're going to be a PhD or master's degree, write, and get yourself heard with your ideas. It, it happens. It, it moves. Very good, Carmen. That's Beth. You want to talk about the future? Well, um, about the future. I think that this is um, uh, the, the way, the, the experience that we are having now is the way that we are going to work in the future because this is um, an open door that we are not going to shut down. We are not going to, to close. Um, maybe we are going to combine um, hybrid classes sometime maybe, but um, this is an open door that is not going to be closed. We are going to use more the technology, the internet. Um, I, ha I hope that this, um, this um, way of learning and teaching through internet will, will um, make a better, um, a, a better web, a, a better um, a structure for, to, to make better the internet Yes, to so more um, more um, investment in the infrastructure of the um, of the island to get more be, more and better uh, internet. That's the the future I see. That we are going to be to have a more robust internet, and because it, this this came to stay. That's right. Yes, people are waiting for things to go back to normal. They are not going back to normal. This is our normal now. So what we need to do is um, review the curriculum, review the way we are teaching. Uh, we need to make changes. We need to adapt. Parents need to understand that it's all change. They cannot rely on the teacher to be all the time there because look what happened. They were too comfortable. And Students, they need to, to learn how to work for their future, not depending on, on other ones. So we, there has to be a very big change in, in the way we are teaching. 
and we have to modify the curriculum. We have to go in the university. There has to be changes. You know, they cannot teach, uh, prepare the teachers for an education that is not there. It's not the same anymore. So there have to be changes. I was sharing your article in the uh, YouTube stream there. So um, everyone can have a chance to read it and you'll have additional. <laughs> it's in uh, Spanish. I, I have to translate in English, but again, that's the other strange thing. You have 500, 500 million people who speak Spanish and growing. So we, we have to think about doing publishing also and getting ideas from those. And you and I have been talking about that for years. Uh, and we'll someday <laughs> succeed at getting some of this. Uh, and you have been more successful than I have, I must say, uh, in getting things in Spanish. Of course, you know the language slightly better than me, too. Um, my two years of Spanish have left me uh, a long time ago. I, I do want to thank uh, the people that came in with Edgar so much. So it was so great to have Carmen with us and Betsy Beth with us. And, uh, and you, Edgar, uh, and, and, and Edgar has tried a pilot show like Silver Lighting for Learning for the Caribbean, for Latin America. And uh, so he's been experimenting with many things. He's constantly uh, tinkering and thinking and contacting people for ideas and advice. And it's great to have you come in and share what you have done so far and what you're attempting to do towards the future. And next week, we're going to have another exciting show. Uh, we'll have people who are going to talk to us about um, courses that have been global, courses that, gone, that went from local to global in the area in, of environmental uh, management and cleanup. Uh, a woman by the name of Gail Woon is the, uh, created an NGO called Earth Care. And she partnered with a professor from Cornell, uh, Marian Krasny, who had students and contacts around the world and together they created MOOCs for a cause and got um, people from seven different places around the world working together to clean up the environment. And nice. five of those people will be coming in from uh, Africa, from the US and from the Caribbean to talk to us about what they've done so far. Uh, and, and what they've accomplished and what's towards the future. So we look forward to that show. And uh, we have a show after that with another uh, environmental scientist coming in from the University of Colorado. So a couple of weeks in a row, we'll be talking about the envir environmental issues. And that second show, she'll talk a bit about Antarctica, in fact. So I want to wow. people a little bit. So again, I, we want to thank, and we want to say uh, it's been a wonderful show.